just curious because treatment burden has such implication for uh, you know a discussion around patient characteristics, their quality of life, uh, what exactly they're 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 facing uh, aside from you know this this regular treatment. Can, Dr. Clark, can you sort of define the patient population that we're observing here in the Panorama trial? What what are they generally going through? Are there any comorbid conditions? I'm assuming the age is uh, older. Well, you know, this is actually, and that's an important um, uh, issue that you bring up related to the Panorama study. That the, the target population that we're looking at here are patients with moderately severe to severe non-proliferative disease. It only accounts for about 10% of patients with diabetic retinopathy. It's a very narrow band of diabetic retinopathy. And it's important to uh, identify this patient population if you're considering treatment for regression, because if if patients have less severe disease than level 47, then the, the risk of progression to site-threatening illness is very low in that population. And so the, the benefit for treatment is significantly reduced in patients that have even moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So the first key when you're considering uh, treatment for regression of diabetic retinopathy or for the progress, excuse me, for the prevention of site-threatening complications it's important to really identify the target population that you that are most likely to benefit from treatment. And again, that's a fairly narrow group of patients that have basically severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So the 4-2-1 rule is sort of an easy one for clinicians to follow. Um, that group of patients can be somewhat varied. These, these patients um, uh, typically are type 2 diabetics. They've had diabetes for at least 20 years. Oftentimes, they do have a number of quote, comorbidities, but the real key to identifying patients that may benefit from uh, low dose anti-VEGF suppression of their retinopathy is a narrow band of patients with severe non-proliferative disease. Excellent, that's great. And uh, I, I guess if we were to look forward a little bit more, as, as you said, this is sort of at the tail end uh, you know, of this greater uh, assessment that we've had for Flibercept, which is great. Um, if we're if we're looking ahead a little bit, um, you know, it, it stands uh, to to believe that essentially we we really want to have these this drug class, the anti VEGF class, really refined and understood at uh, you know its absolute optimal doses going forward, just because of the aging population and the greater prevalence of uh, diabetes risks, and of course inherently uh, the risk for um, these these conditions. Is is that something that you see as I guess? a growing discussion in, in, in the field, uh, Dr. Clark? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, treating for prevention of vision threatening complications, the key, here, the key here is to sort of understand what the minimum dose required is. And I think that's one of the nice things about the 16 week group is that in year two, it doesn't really look like there's any difference. If you treat patients uh, every eight work weeks versus every 16 weeks, if what your goal is, is to prevent complications such as the onset of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the onset of clinically significant macular edema. It is a fairly low dose of anti-VEGF therapy every four months. It appears to be the same as more aggressive dosing. So that's an important data point going forward, both for the use of a flibercept, as well as the development of other platforms looking at extended drug delivery to really look at the minimum dose required to really change the paradigm. Again, this is a paradigm shift in retina. We've been used to treating patients once they lose vision from diabetic macular edema, once they develop proliferative disease and the complications of that. But, you know, there is some resistance to this line of treatment in retina because we're, we're accustomed to treating uh, end-stage complications and we are concerned about the risks associated with sequential anti-VEGF injections. You know, as we move into the future, we're understanding that we don't need to use the drugs nearly as frequently as we've seen here in Panorama. And then we're going to have other platforms that extend the delivery even more. You know, in terms of the current study, um, the, the current standard of care for managing patients with severe non-proliferative disease is observation every four months. So if you're not going to treat patients with anti-VEGF therapy to regress severe non-proliferative disease, you still have to see them three times a year. The only difference between the current standard of care and giving them the opportunity for a 75% reduction in the rate of vision threatening complications is the addition of an injection three times a year. Now there is some incremental risk. There is some incremental cost. There's no question to that. But the Panorama study clearly demonstrates at even treatment at that level, we reduce the risk of, of proliferative disease and uh, clinically significant diabetic macular edema by 75%. So these are powerful data. 
and our community is still trying to figure out how to use that data. 